Hi, welcome to the session of Industrial Portal Gateways, a deep dive of MOXA MGate 5105. My name is Philip Wayne. I'm a senior threat researcher in forward-looking threat research team of Trend Micro. This study is a teamwork with Marco Bagduzzi, Charles Perrin, Ryan Flores, Rainer Fossler, and Luca Bongiorni. So first of all, thank you for having us here. Um, as the team has already delivered several talks around the topic, um, this talk is intended to be a deep dive of Moxa M gates. So if you want to have a high-level uh, overview of portal gateways, please refer to my previous talk in RSA, Asia Pacific, and Japan. And if you want to have a deep dive of real-time gateways, uh, please refer to Marco Bagduzzi's talk in Black Hat US. So um, we have decided to do a thorough study of portal gateways in terms of translations. We want to make it cross-vendor, so um, everyone choose a vendor that's representative in the world. Uh, since I am Taiwanese and Moxa is a Taiwanese vendor, so there's no brainer for me to choose Moxa. So here is how it looked like when it arrives. So that's the cotton box. Uh, when you open the cotton box, uh, you see the uh, quick installation guide, user menus, and uh, a, a, a serial console cable, and the M-Gate portal gateway itself. It's quite minimalistic. And here's how the front panel looks. So uh, from the front panel, you see two power LEDs, one red LED. You have an LED for a mode bus and one for Ethernet IP. There are two Ethernet, uh, uh, Ethernet jacks and one console and uh, one 9-pin uh, mode bus uh, connector uh, for, mod uh, for both mode bus uh, over RS-232 and uh, RS-485. And on the back panel, uh, you have two power inputs. Uh, the power input ranges from 12 volts to 48 volts. Um, you have one relay and one, uh, one slot for micro SD card. So if you insert the micro SD card uh, before the device boots, uh, the device would dump the whole database as a backup to the micro SD card. So actually, you get everything from the dump. And um, this is not what we want to do because we want to study remote vulnerabilities and uh, um, the translation errors of the device. So that uh, we will just put this topic aside. Um, on the bottom, you see a label and there is a production serial number on the label. And luckily, this time, we don't have a serial number that works uh, as a single key to everything. So it is pretty nice. And then we open up the lid. This is one of the bad habits that uh, whenever we get something, we just open it up. And luckily, there is no pressure button inside the lid that erases the double EEPROMs and the firmware once we remove it. And on the circuit above, you see a power isolation circuit that's pretty neat. And on the lower side, um, you see something like a JTAG. Uh, we will take a closer look. Let's zoom in. So here are um, four pins that's used as a um, most likely a new art in for de uh, internal debugging. And you have uh, 16 pins here, uh, just like a JTAG. Uh, we didn't dig deeper into these connectors because, um, you know, if you want to touch the internal circuit, you have to open up the lead, which means you are in proximity of the device. And that's out of the scope of the study, so we just leave them alone. And Muxa comes with a telnet interface that's very minimalistic. You just log in with uh, admin account, admin and Muxa, and you know it's a very good reminder that the Muxa tells you you have to change the default password because the default password is known by everybody, so that's not secure. It's it's a really good reminder. Uh, then you have a very simple interface that uh, you can change some thing, some minimal things. And luckily, all the input strings are sanitized, which means that uh, if you just input a very long A's, uh, there's no segmentation fault, no hang-ups. So that's pretty good. And 
Before I can go further, uh, allow me to explain a little bit uh, how data data station types of portal gateway works. So there used to be several routines working at the same time, but we can just make it simpler by thinking there are two routines. The first routine is a parser. It parses the input and uh, the it just reads the inbound packet and parse the commands and um, read the input and put it to the internal memory. And the second routine scans the internal memory and see if any value has been changed. Then it checks the IO mapping table and trigger the commands that fits the, the change of the internal memory and sends uh, the translated output to multiple slaves. And this is a typical interface of Moxa mGate um, web user interface. Uh, you can enable and disable the consoles, and at the very bottom you see there's one Moxa command, uh, which we will co go come back in a little bit. And the first thing you have to decide for a protocol gateway is that you have to decide from which protocol you want to translate to which protocol. So here is an example of translating Ethernet IP to Modbus RTU. And actually, you can translate from Ethernet IP to Modbus TCP, or Ethernet IP to Modbus RTU, or um, Modbus TCP to Modbus RTU, uh, anything you want. And actually, Moxa has a very, very interesting uh, implementation of Ethernet IP, um, which we are not going to talk about today. That might be subject to the next study. And uh, today we are going to talk about uh, Modbus TCP to Modbus RTU. So when you have decided from which protocol you want to translate to which protocol, the first thing you have to do is to design a uh, IO mapping table. Um, on the screen above, you'll see a table of Modbus commands. That's uh, the functions that you want to trigger when anything has been changed. So we have put function 5, write coil, function 6, write register, function 15, write multiple coils, and function 16, write multiple registers. And the table at the bottom shows that uh, whenever the internal address, for example, internal address 0 is changed, it triggers command 1. And when internal address 16 to 17 is changed, it triggers command 2. And you might have noticed that there's some overlapping addresses here. Uh, for example, if you change a value at uh, internal address 16 to 17, it triggers both command 2 and command 4. Um, you might think it's nonsense, but actually it's not. Um, it's like um, if you have two slave devices that want to receive the same settings at the same time, you might have assigned two separate commands, one for each slave device. So after proper configuration, um, you can uh, set up a test bed just like this. Um, you might have noticed that uh, the, the power is actually a 12 volt um, power converter that's uh, off the shelf that I have torn apart from somewhere else. And uh, I have a very Hackaday style power jack that's connect, connected to a two-way relay that's connected to a Raspberry Pi running Bluefuzzer. And Bluefuzzer is sending packets uh, via the Ethernet cable to uh, Modbus TCP input. And then Moxa translates it to Modbus RTU that uh, we read from uh, with the US, uh, USB to serial converter that you see above. So Bluefuzzer is a very powerful and very adaptive uh, fuzzing framework. It's open source and uh, it's really, really useful. We have extended it and uh, um, implemented many, many uh, fuzzing, fuzzing tests. For example, we have changed the packet length, uh, the packet size, and uh, we have introduced the trailing garbages, everything. And uh, Moxa has a very robust um, inbound parser that uh, even with these uh, in invalid lanes, invalid CRC, invalid package, multiple packets, and the trailing garbage, the parts that didn't hang. So that's quite robust. That's really good. 
Um, but however, uh, when I check the I/O mapping table and the internal memory uh, by using the I/O data view function that Moxa has provided on the web user interface, things uh, didn't look that good. Uh, why is that so? It's like uh, if you have noticed that uh, we have only configured uh, Moxa address, sorry, Modbus address. 4x01 to 4x04 and 4x09 to 4x056. Um, so that's the, the area that's like in, in the rectangulars. Um, those addresses outside the red areas are actually changed and filled with random data. So you might think, what, what's going on here? What's wrong? And um, why is the like, why is the internal address that's not defined by our commands um, is also filled with data? So, you know, there must be something wrong here. And uh, actually, I'm quite confused by 4x because according to the manual, 4x01 means um, the internal address starts from 1, and 0x something means the internal address starts from 0. So you might think 4x01 equals uh, 0x, zero, 0, 0, right? But actually, no, we don't really know what 4x stands for here. So uh, we decided to just uh, input the data one after another and see what's going on. So um, you can use function 5 just like to turn on and off a switch. Um, we try to turn uh, address 0 on and off, and you see the RTU address 1 is turned on and off. That's good, right? But uh, when you turn uh, switch 1 and switch 2 on and off, you are uh, you're still uh, seeing RTU address 1 being flipped on and off. And then you just increment the address uh, all the way to 10, 11, 13, 12, and 13, and you have noticed that Wait, well, why is function six triggered? We 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 are like uh, we're just flipping the bits on and off, and you know it should have nothing to do with function six, which has uh, to deal with the holding registers. So here is actually how it works. Um, we have finally figured out this is the normal operation. So you first define all the commands and uh, what which function it has to trigger when the data changes. Then you define a range of internal memory that's routine to is going to monitor. And uh, when the data within the monitored uh, area has been changed, it issues and triggers the command. So in a normal operation, um, you just issue function five address one to turn the coil on. And then the internal memory address zero is changed from zero to one. And then the scanner, the routine two, uh, detects the change in internal address one, sorry, internal address zero, and it triggers command one and sends uh, the command one that is function five, say the ID one to address one and quantity one, etc. So there might be a way to misuse it. Um, for example, um, if we are writing to a coil or a switch that's not previously defined or is uh, out of bound, it's actually divided by eight um, because uh, one byte is eight bits. So one byte of internal memory uh, actually holds eight switches. So you can just turn on a non-existing switch and change the value uh, anywhere in the table. So anywhere in the internal memory. And whenever you have an internal memory that's covered by, for example, command three or command four, you are triggering command three or four, depending on um, which address you have changed in the internal memory. And maybe you might think this is not a big deal because you know th this is everything we have defined. So let's uh, look at the demo. So uh, we have used a VT scatter to mock an HMI, and you see there is a critical threshold um, that you can usually change from a holding register. And of course, you want to set a firewall that prevents the holding register to be changed by unauthorized persons. However, anyone can just 
use function 5 to flip a bit in the holding register, uh, it's something you might not block. Uh, for example, we are writing address 22 here. So 22 is the uh, leftmost, most significant bit of the holding register, and it's changed to um, 1800 degrees. That's a very high degree, and your things might melt in production line. Or we can even change its negative value because it's a signed value. So uh, the leftmost bit setting to 1 means it's a negative sign. This would be really, really bad. And uh, this is, uh, and we're not stopping here. So from the firmware downloaded from the Moxus website, uh, we are able to decrypt the firmware. Um, even though the firmware is encrypted, you can actually Google and find a way to extract the, the AES key that you can use open SSL command line to decrypt it. And just use Bingwalk, it's possible to extract everything in the firmware. Uh, that way we have learned that it's actually run in BusyBox 1.24.2, uh, which has several non-vulnerabilities. We have tested uh, Moxo with these non-vulnerabilities, but uh, failed. Um, we have also extracted the default password for root, uh, root user admin. And uh, we use a John Ripper to brute force the password, and of, of course the password is Moxa. So, you know, that didn't really help. And uh, maybe you think it's possible to log in as root, but root has a default shell to Bainforce, so we cannot really use it to log in. And luckily, uh, Dolph Chu, a really good colleague of mine, has helped uh, figuring out that whenever you have logged in as a normal user, you don't even have to be a administrator. Uh, it's possible to just go to the ping test page and uh, type a uh, semicolon busybox telnet d to open up the port that allows you to telnet in, and uh, it doesn't ask for any credential, and you got a root shell. It's it's really nice, but the problem with that is that you have to log in first, and. It's possible to bypass a login with a session ID if you know the session ID, which means you either have to um, sniff the network traffic and intercept the session ID, or you have to make an, an educated guess and brute force the session ID, which we will talk in a bit again. So since most of the field engineers are um, using Windows-based program to manage um, M, M gate. So this is uh, the M gate manager that Moxa provides for Windows users. And if you are a field engineer, you just um, plug your plug a, a network cable onto your laptop and then run M gate manager and you click on the scan button. The scan button uh, would trigger a would send a UDP broadcasting packet so that uh, if the, there's an M-gate, Moxa M-gate device on the, on the local area network, it returns the name, the serial number, and description of the Moxa M-gate portal gateway. And everything is transmitted over UDP port 4800 and TCP port 4900. But most of the things are not encrypted, so we can read them just as clear text. And that is the Moxa command. So um, we decided to use Scapy to try to figure out uh, how Moxa command works. So we have identified the packet format. It's what you have seen above. Uh, the format is like two bytes of commands, like 0100 is used to identify the device, and the respond is um, or with 0x80. And uh, it's followed by the length and the sequence number. And the sequence number is followed by uh, six bytes. I don't know why it is there. It's, uh, I don't know what that means. Then it's followed by the MAC address of the Moxa device that you want to talk to. Then it fo it's followed by the data itself. So we have figured out that there's something like a keep alive or filler uh, that uh, if you open the M gate. Manager, it just sends the keep alive packet over and over again. And when this queries the device name is uh, 1000, that's a command. So, you know, 
it's not really possible to brute force. Uh, sorry, uh, it's not possible to just record for a very long time and study all the commands. So we decided to ask our best friend Ida Pro. So this is what Ida told us. So this is the Moxa commands that's supported by uh, Moxa mGate fifty one oh five. You can actually set admin password, get get peer names, set time of day, set console, upgrade firmware, etc. If you know how to issue the commands, that's really useful, right? But the problem is that um, most of these commands are privileged commands and uh, requires you to log in as admin in advance. So how does it do? Um, so for example, you want to log in or uh, any field engineer wants to log in. The first thing is that it pops up a dialog box asking you to type the username and password. The, the username is what you see here. It's padded with zeros to eight bytes, sending in clear text. Then the password is actually a nonce conjuncted with the password, and you use MD5 to hash it. So what's being transmitted over the Ethernet is uh, the MD5 hash. And how do we know that? It's because our very good friend Ida Pro told us. So this is how things look like. Um, Moxa mGate manager uh, uses 0001 command to get a nonce, and a four bytes of nonce is returned. Then it uses password uh, conjuncted with the nonce, then it calculates the MD5, and the MD5 is returned to, um, to authenticate this login. And so the thing is that if the nonce is really random, then we are game over here. We have to find another way to exploit another thing. But, you know, when God closes uh, the door, he opens up the window. So here's the window. Uh, we have reversed SDS DSC ID and noticed that, oh, uh, it's calling RAND to get a random number, but there's no S RAND for the seed. It means that each time um, when SDS DSC ID is restarted, or each time you reboot the device, the nonce is actually repeating itself and it matches our observation. So it implies that. Um, you can just intercept as long as you can and um, accumulate enough um, enough nonces, and uh, you can just send over uh, the non uh, the the encrypted hash. You can do the replay attack, the, and there's no problem because the nonce is repeating itself. You will eventually uh, get the right uh, encrypted password. And there are several suggested ways to uh, get a random number out of a Linux box. For example, um, not really recommended is the SRAND time known. It's because the, the time resolution is limited. So if you have a, a lot of threads uh, doing this SRAND time at the same time, you get the same seed. And that's not very good. You can actually get the random seed uh, from the DVU random. And but the problem is that uh, if you are doing it really fast, there might be some entropy issues, and you can get it from DV random, but it might block the thread. So um, since Linux four four point eight, uh, a new algorithm called Cha Cha two point zero is introduced in uh, U random, so that uh, it ensures that you can get a really good random number each time you you get uh, read something from DVU random. So that's really good, but the problem is that embedded devices might not be running such a new Linux kernel. So anyway, um, Moxa doesn't call srand before calling rand, and that's not a good practice. And when we were sniffing the traffic, we have noticed something very interesting. Um, you can see the table on the right-hand side uh, is actually transmitting mysterious numbers in ASCII. And you might think, what can that be? So um, we reversed engineer a little bit more, and we found that, okay, so 0 and 0, 0 is a fixed value. 
followed by a lens of original file. And uh, uh, you have actually the AES key in the beginning of the dump. So this encrypted configuration is actually being sent from Moxa device to MGate manager so that field engineer has all the, uh, all the configurations that uh, he or she can change on in the graphical user interface. And then uh, when the field engineer closes the program, uh, Moxa MGate manager would upload the database again in the same format. So all you have to do is just to um, wire shark or T shark it and uh, save the PCAP. And we have even written a Python script uh, that calls Scapy to parse the PCAP and uh, reassemble the MGate uh, dumps. Well, we're calling the dump mgate5105.ini because it's exactly the same thing that you can find on an SD card. And one of the problem is that we don't know how to decrypt the file. Um, not really, we don't know everything about it, uh, but uh, we have tried to re-implement the function in PyCrypto, but we failed to do so. So um, in order to save some time, uh, we just wanted to load uh, Moxa's share library and use it to um, decrypt the file for us. So how to do that? A uh, cross tool ng is a very useful utility that you can use to um, prepare the compile time runtime. So we use uh, cross tool ng um, and uh, with ARM unknown Linux GNU EABI to reconstruct all the compiling env environment. And we have a tiny proof of concept um, C program that you can just cross compile and use QMU on to run it. So this is the actual program. It uses DL open to load uh, libconfig.so from Moxas firmware. And it's uh, finding the decrypt config v1 AES from the symbol table, uh, load the address to a function pointer. And we're calling this function pointer with the mgate5105.ini that we have just dumped from the pcap file. And it will be decrypted and saved to decrypted.tgz. And um, this is what's being decrypted. It's config data along with a lot of database and the database is in SQLite format. So just use ordinary SQLite 3 to uh, you can dump the whole database and see what's going on inside. Uh, you have the password shadow and uh, SN, SNMP configuration and even an SSH key that I don't know what, uh, where it's used in. So there are good days, there are bad days. And this is hacking the box, so we're not only talking to you about the good days. And in order to learn how Moxa mGate 5105 works, I have done a thorough study of the booting sequence. And uh, that's not really helpful, to be honest. And first, uh, it runs a auto login uh, with a console, console program. But the console program requires you to um, like insert the console cable. So you have to be within the proxim uh, proximity to the box. So that's not what we want to do. So next, um, there's RCS that uh, it's basically um, making the configuration directory and extracting some extracting default settings and then mounting the right partition, user configuration partition, and get the serial number starting configuration services and then running the SDS, DSCID, our good old friend. Then it's running MMCCD, um, which is a daemon that detects the insertion of an SD card. So you, if you have the SD card inserted before this step, it's dumping the database. So it's mounting it first, then dumping the database to the SD card. And uh, um, if you have configured it, it's also saving the log files onto the SD card. So then it's began to initialize the network configurations like IP tables, SNMP, uh, DPD, etc. And the LLD, LLPD, LLDPD is uh, probably something that we have found on the GitHub. 
then it's initializing the DHCP for IP address. Then it's running an identity. Eventity might be a Moxa internal daemon for uh, event loops. So there are several Moxa daemons that's possible to pass uh, IPC communications by identity. We are trying to exploit it here, but uh, we didn't make it. Then there is a telnet D that takes our telnet to port 23. It's a busy box. And there's something very interesting. There is a telnet 6000 that listens to a UDP packet to port 6000. It's actually calling command a uh, system, the system system call to uh, run a UTCP dump command that has a percent %s. And you know, when, whenever you have a system and a percent %s, there might be a chance to exploit it, but no. Uh, the input are fixed, so it's not vulnerable. And uh, um, it's running go ahead web server 2.1.8, so uh, we have Googled it a bit and learned that it's vulnerable to CB 2017.17562. So we have tried it, but not vulnerable, so maybe Moxa has already patched it. We have studied a little bit about the lab protocol, and uh, we have found one undocumented protocol supported or not supported by the by this protocol gateway, but we cannot exploit it. And um, we have found two hard coded keys in labconfig.so. Um, it's the first key is Moxa Technology DN, and the second key is uh, Moxa Tech DN. Actually, the second key is used um, in the procedure of encrypting the password hashes. So this is how we um, inspect it. Uh, you first pad the hard-coded uh, hard key Moxa Tech DN to 16 bytes. Then you pad the uh, admin password to 16 bytes as well. Um, you take the SHA-256 uh, of Moxa, uh, the default password, take the digest, and uh, take the first 60 bytes of digest, make it hexified. Then you use it um, to, uh, then you use the hard coded key to AES encrypt it. Then you get a binary. So that matches uh, our observation in the very beginning of the mgate5105.ini file, uh, the database dump file. Uh, why I'm saying it's failed because uh, there's no way to implement mgate AES encrypt and AES decrypt with a Pi crypto. We have tried several times and uh, failed. So maybe Moxa has their own implementation. So uh, yeah, you know, if you cannot uh, make all the protocols from scratch, you are not really doing anything. And we have noticed that there is a user T struct a C structure uh, that's storing username, system clock, and the password, and the session ID, etc. Um, session ID is the session ID that uh, we were trying to brute force uh, when we have found the ping test vulnerability. So uh, what I have done is to first log into the root shell, um, run the FTPD so that I can download anything that interested me, and then I have uploaded GDB server onto Moxa and have it running. Then use PS to find the PID of the web server. Then it's possible to just cat proc PID and the maps to find where the heap is. And um, I have uploaded a short program that dumps the heap from me into a file. And the heap is um, on this. On this example, uh, the PID is 1020 and the heap followed by the heap. So it's dumping the heap and uh, here is the hex dump of the heap. So you can actually see the structure. Uh, each user structure takes 840 hexadecimal bytes. The I plus four is the username, so admin. And I plus 24 is the system clock. Uh, the system clock is the second uh, from the system since the system boot. So that 
whenever you reboot the system, it's zero, and then zero, one, two, three, four, etc. And the session ID is the MD5 digest of the system time. So it's, wow, that's good, because if I just restart the system, for example, I can use a command to issue the reboot, um, issue the reboot commands over multiple TCP that's, uh, because there's a magic packet documented in the manual. Then the system time got reset to zero, and you can make a really quick guess by calculating the MD5 of zero, one, two, three, four, right? But no, it's not working. So the problem is that uh, Moxa is taking a 128 bytes out of the stack. The system block, uh, the, the system clock is in the very beginning of the stack, and there's some un initialized garbage trailing garbage in the stack, so that there's no way to calculate the right MD5 without guessing the trailing garbage, and the the trailing garbage is randomized um, at all. Uh, like it, when when whenever you reboot the system, it's randomized, not because uh, Moxa wanted to randomize it, but because the stack is not initialized, the 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 memory is not zeroed out. So if Moxa has had obeyed some good programming rule that initialized the stack before their Ethernet, maybe we have the chance to brute force it. So you know Moxa is really lucky here. And this is another failure. So, um, you know, as a reverse engineer, we really like to see sprintf with percent %s. sprintf means there's a chance to um, buffer overflow, and percent %s means you have the chance to control the input. And even though Moxa is using smprintf here, um, that's actually not smprintf because the, the length is actually taken from the input. So they are, you know, it's equivalent to doing an sprintf without the real length of the buffer. So, you know, promise they don't use smprintf this way. However, uh, after a very careful inspection of all smprintf uh, costs uh, within the code base, I'm not able to identify any place that I can control to uh, caused a buffer overrun, so failed. And um, this excerpt of code is the uh, SDS, SCD, uh, DSCID, our old friend, that read, that's reading a packet, a UDP packet, and put it to buff2. The problem is that you cannot send a really long UDP packet. It has a maximum length of something like uh, 1,500 bytes. And uh, uh, after this receive, uh, Moxa is also testing the length of the UDP packet, so there's no chance to uh, run a buffer overflow of it. Better luck. So all in all, uh, this is a summary of the vulnerabilities that we have identified. We have followed the ZDI's responsible disclosure and reported all the vulnerabilities back to Moxa. And Moxa has either fixed it or provided a mitigation plan to the customers. Uh, we really want to express our gratitude to Moxa for their timely manner and prompt responses. They are very responsible, and uh, they you know, have fixed everything, and that's good. So here is the talk. Thank you again for attending this talk. Should you have any questions, feel free to drop me an email, or uh, see you at Hack in the Box Discord channel. You can ask any questions you want, I'm happy to answer. And if you have some spare time, please scan the QR code on the right-hand side. Uh, it's a link to our white paper, and you can find more portable gateways in depth in the white paper. So thank you again, and uh, have a good conference.